It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round presenter, uh, Dr. Jay McNeil. Dr. McNeil began his career as a paramedic in 1994 with the Troy Township Fire Department in Geauga County, Ohio. Did I say that right? Geauga. Geauga County, Ohio. It's Indian for raccoon. Yeah. There you go. And you've all learned something today. Uh, where he served as a firefighter, paramedic, hazmat specialist, and a captain until 2002. Uh, he attended undergrad at Bowling Green State University and then went on to get a master's in public health uh, from the Northwest Ohio Consortium for Public Health in 2002. He continued working as a paramedic while attending medical school at the Edward Via Virginia College of Osteopathic so Medicine, uh, from which he graduated in 2008. Jay did his residency at Akron General Hospital, during which time he served as assistant medical director for Coventry Township and Copley Township Fire, as well as Akron PD SWAT. He then went on to complete a fellowship in EMS and disaster medicine at, is that, is that Yale University? Yale, yes. Yale, uh, Yale University in 2012. <laughs> After finishing his fellowship, uh, Jay accepted the position of EMS medical director for Mercy Health System in Janesville in 2012. Since that time, uh, Dr. McNeil has expanded operations to include medical direction for EMS providers in Rock County and Walworth County. And then just this past June, he was named the Director of Emergency Medical Services for the Mercy Rockford Health System in Rockford, Illinois, and has taken lead for EMS in Winnebago County as well. Uh, with his growing team of five physicians and fleet of MD-1 physician response vehicles, they average about 30 calls for service per week across the three county area. Month. Unless that's 30 yeah, it's a month? A, yeah, it's about 30 a month with oh. the two. We, we don't know what we're gonna do with the third one yet. Sorry, 30 calls a month uh, across the three county area and two state uh, the area they service. Uh, Jay's presented at the National Association of EMS Physicians annual conference. He's authored chapters in public health management textbooks and given countless interviews to news outlets across Southern Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. He provides regional guidance through his role as executive committee member of the South Central Regional Trauma Advisory Council and is a highly influential member of the Region 5 Healthcare Coalition. Uh, Dr. McNeil is also the director of the EMS Training Center at Janesville Mercy. And last month, under his supervision, they opened a new tactical EMS training center. It's 25,000 square feet of space in the Mercy Care Building and promises to be a draw for EMS and law enforcement agencies all across the region. The goal of the new tactical training center is to prepare EMS and law enforcement to respond into potentially hostile environments to work together effectively when the scene hasn't been cleared to preserve life. Um, the mock-up practice environments for the new tactical training center include a church, classrooms, a theater, an office or business, an emergency room, and a residence. Additionally, they have a new $150,000 patient simulator named Oscar. Caesar. Caesar. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> Oscar's uh, his cousin. Oscar's his cousin. He's low fidelity. He blinks, breathes, screams, and bleeds until they put on tourniquets and manage his wounds. Uh, somehow, Dr. McNeil still finds time to balance work and a home life uh, with his wife of 13 years and their four small children. Wow. Jay's truly a leader in the world of EMS. His scope of influence has continued to grow exponentially over the three very short years. I'm excited to hear his presentation today on the EMS physician field response, uh, but even more excited to see where he drives the field of out of hospital care next and to continue working with him and all of the Mercy Health team members. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jay McNeil. The intro took longer than the presentation, so it, that's not true. So I gave a lecture last night to some fire chiefs in Illinois, and when the guy that was in charge stood up and started walking behind me, I guess I was done. So um, they asked me to come and present. They didn't tell me how long I had, so the usual presentation is about you know half an hour and then questions. So apparently they wanted the five-minute version, which is nearly impossible to cover all the stuff that we're doing. So that uh, is kind of what we look like for you guys from the air. Right there, there's that little little piss ant right there and then I see that when you're landing over top of us very intimidating so uh, what we want to talk about is why do we do this um, so I pulled up some studies and this is propensity for performing interventions in pre-hospital trauma management comparison between docs and non-docs um, 
So the incidence of endotracheal intubation and immobilization of extremities was greater among patients supported by physician compared to ALS. And this finding has to be interpreted, uh, their selection bias, because the doctors went to more severe calls. The other thing you have to look at when you read all these studies is there's not been any good studies comparing a very aggressive RSI paramedic system to the physician response. So a lot of these uh, Franco, uh, German, and European countries, they send out anesthesia and ER doctors, but the paramedics there aren't necessarily at the same level of our paramedics in Rock, Walworth, and Dane County. So it's really hard to extrapolate data from these studies that are done overseas. It's hard to run studies here because the physician response programs are um, somewhat disjointed, they're not well established, and they are kind of, um, they vary a lot. Some of them are just the medical director shows up when they feel like it, whereas our approach is a little bit different. We're a 24-7 operation with two trucks, and November 1st we'll probably have three trucks 24-7 with a backup physician available to augment that. So this study, uh, multi-center Canadian study of pre-hospital trauma, in urban centers with highly specialized level one trauma centers, there's no benefit in having on-site ALS for the pre-hospital management of trauma patients. Um, there was also a study that came out last week that says that paramedics confer no benefit over EMTs in a lot of situations. So you gotta take all these studies with a grain of salt because if I'm the guy or girl laying there with an open femur fracture and you're telling me that the EMTs can care for me just the same as my paramedics that have fentanyl, Dilaudid, and ketamine for pain management, I take exception to that. So this study, doctors and pre-hospital on scene times. Um, in summary, the study explores a clinically relevant area. Reduced on scene times influence the outcome for patients. That is very much debatable. Um, however, whether doctor delivered advanced life support in the pre-hospital phase influences on scene time is still debatable. <laughs> There's multiple studies showing that physicians on scene don't influence scene times and actually complete more procedures than ALS or an RN paramedic flight crew. But to extrapolate that to a ground physician model that has one doctor on the physician truck that responds to Evansville, which is a BLS, versus with Janesville, which is two paramedics plus engine paramedics, or to respond to Turtle, which is first responder only, and I'm waiting for an ambulance from Beloit to get there. So it's very hard to do research on these types of issues. Um, outcome following physician supervised pre-hospital resuscitation. This basically shows that anesthesiologists, so this is probably a foreign study because anesthesiologists here wouldn't be caught dead out in the field, okay? <laughs> They're busy scheduling their nurse anesthetist to do all their cases and eating lunch. <laughs> Any anesthesia in the room? Okay. You can pull that out of the recording. So. And actually, we, we mess with our anesthesia team just like you guys do. So I walk in for this ACO meeting we had last night, and I'm walking in behind them. They hand me their um, empty plates. I said, well, you just leave it to the ER to clean up all your messes. <laughs> So evidence suggests that some critically ill patients benefit from care provided by a physician. Further studies are needed. That's what every study says. That's how you should conclude every study. Further studies are needed. Uh, traumatic brain injury, physician provided care. TBI patient mortality was significantly lower and good neuro outcome higher in patients treated by the physician EMS group. Oh, maybe we're on to something at 2015. So. Uh, you might have heard Mark Twain said this, but it was actually Benjamin Disraeli that said this. He says, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. So those of you that have done research, it's very easy to get caught up in the research, and sometimes the research can kind of end up where you think it's going to end up. We did a study recently with Beloit Fire Department. We put pulse tracking watches on all of the firefighters, and we changed how they were alerted. Um, we thought that we would show that the ramp up tone would greatly decrease their pulses. We did, we didn't get enough data to, to probably get it published, um, but what we found is the firefighters felt better at the end of their shift and that was just as an important of an endpoint as the statistics. So you have to be very cautious when you interpret research. So we don't know what we don't know. So when I was a paramedic, I knew everything, okay? And then I went to undergrad and I'm like, well, I didn't know biology. Then I went to public health and like, I didn't know how to develop systems. And then med school, I didn't know much of anything. And then residency, I was like, those attendings don't know anything. Um, and now that I'm an attending and fellowship trained, I'm like, I, 
I know a lot, but I'm more worried about the stuff that I don't know. And that's the stuff that is scary when you practice. So EMS became a subspecialty. There's guidelines here for what is required and what a good EMS physician looks like. And NAEMSP and ASAP have policy papers. And if you read one of the first key points there, maintain a presence in the field to provide on-scene medical direction, assess compliance to protocols and policy, observe the quality of patient care, and be a resource and a teacher. So the main role of the MD1 really has been teaching. Occasionally we do superstar doctor stuff that saves lives, but the main thing is teaching. And as great as the sim lab is, we've got a lot of simulators. I think we're up to family of five sim people. Um, but it's important to be there with a real patient. All of you are doing emergency medicine and you either are in or will be soon in a residency. And why do you do that? To get the patient exposure. Anybody could sit and read Rosen's, but it's when you apply it to the patient. So to do that in real time with the paramedics and explain why we're going to crank the CPAP up to 10, even though the protocol actually only says five with this specific patient, or why this patient's going to get RSI before we even think about moving them out of their house versus the one last week that we did it in the truck. So those are the things in real time that you work with. And then you want to maintain your knowledge and your skills, and you want to be really good clinically. So I think the ideal blend of a flight physician or an EMS physician is somebody that works clinically a little bit, keeps their hands in it, and uh, teaches and, and does a little bit of research, or at least reads the research. You know, I, I'm from Mercy. We're not academic. So I can't generate a lot of research out of Mercy. Um, we've seen about 400 patients total with the MD1 in three years. That's not really a lot of patients to extrapolate data from. But anecdotally, I can tell you that patients that were asystole trauma arrest shot in the chest have survived to walk out of the hospital, probably because they got the chest tube that took out the blood that the needle that the medic put in couldn't get out. So it shows the value of working together with your EMS team. So this is uh, from Clinical Practice and System Oversight, the book that we are reading right now to study for our subspecialty boards, November 9th. And the, the clock is ticking on that one for us to get our studying done. This counts as studying, right? That's what I told my <laughs> wife. So in EMS, an aggressive, comprehensive, and quality-driven medical educational program combines streetwise didactics, expert clinical apprenticeship, and expert ongoing on-scene supervision and interaction with EMS personnel. So what I've told my providers is quality is job one. And the reason the medical director in the field is not necessarily to check up on you, but to get a, an overview of the system as well as teach you things that you may not know. Remember the red slide, we don't know what we don't know. How are they going to learn what they don't know until we teach them? We want to make sure that the residents receive the best pre-hospital care possible. That's not you, residents. That's residents of our community. We don't care about residents, medical residents. Nobody cares about them, right? Um, offer the patients the best possible outcome. So we want to educate to maximize clinical competency and preparedness, coordinated planning within the community, monitoring trends in evidence-based medicine. So when that heroin issue started in Chicago, I think 96 people overdosed on heroin recently, what we told our providers is single dose of Narcan, intubate immediately. So we try and stay up on those trends because we didn't have enough Narcan on the trucks. I think we carry two dosages. So if we get one of those patients that doesn't respond to the initial dose of Narcan, by the time they're pushing the Narcan, they're already five minutes into the protocol and they could have intubated the patient and fixed the root cause. Monitoring trends, evidence-based medicine. Um, evidence-based medicine is very hard in EMS. We took backboards out of our protocols, I think, in our last revision a year and a half ago. So far, everything's been fine. The EMS providers love it. Um, and I know there's some conflict with the trauma surgeons at times when they come here and they come to other facilities, but I have yet to find a single study that shows any benefit to putting someone on a backboard. I, I just can't find it. So if somebody has it, feel free to send it to me and I'll reconsider. But otherwise, we're not using backboards. Um, you have to consider the, the issues involved. And, and when you think about the paramedic and the firefighters who are standing on the side of the interstate, which is one of the most dangerous places to be, and you had somebody that self-extricated out of their vehicle, and they're walking around their vehicle. We get there 15 minutes later, and now, oh, don't move. Put the sea collar on. Okay, stand here. Oh, hope the semis don't tap your butt on the way by. Just stand here, and, and we're going to put you on this backboard. Now step up on this little pedestal, and then we're going to lay you down flat, and your back doesn't hurt now, but by the time we get to the hospital, it's going to hurt, and we're going to CAT scan you on top of it. 
So th that's kind of the research that Dr. Barney did back in the, I, I think the late 80s even. So it takes, I think, 17 years for a medical intervention to actually make it into the field. So we got there, it took us a while. We're trying to figure out what to use the old backboards for now. Yes, sir. So are, are you uh, saying that um, a, a trauma patient uh, who's walking at the scene uh, perhaps doesn't need a pants scan? <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you have that, those studies? We have, we have well, a we, lot. We could use them. Yeah. <laughs> Desperately. We, we have a lot of studies, if you look at the backboard literature, that shows that backboards don't confer any positive benefit. But as far as, you know, whether you pan scan versus ultrasound someone and serial abdominal exams, that's, you know, you also look, so I did a month of shock trauma. And so a lot of patients that were walking around, you pan scanned them and you found the incidental omas that then you had to deal with. So I understand where trauma is coming from and you, you can never trust the drunk. That's one rule you need to learn. So you pan scan every drunk basically because they, they don't know what's going on with themselves. Um, but as far as pan scan, you know, that, that's uh, an institutional thing that you guys will have to fight through. I think everywhere has those issues. Um, and on our modified traumas, we probably do less CT scanning. On the full traumas where the trauma surgeon comes in, we probably do more pan scan. It just stands to reason. There's a different comfort level. We think everybody's going to die at some point. As ER doctors, everybody that walks in, whether you're working urgent care or the ER, you should think, what's going to kill them today? They're going to die. And, and I know it's a little bit paranoid, but once you stop thinking that, you drop your guard and you're screwed. So the trauma surgeon thinks that everybody's going to die from trauma today. So that's why you pan scan everyone, whether they're walking. You might get a pan scan if you walk near a trauma surgeon. This is the way it works. <laughs> So what we try and do, and what's interesting in our system is with the continuum of the highest level of care available. So if we have a very sick trauma patient, we're kind of, from the time of the 9 call, and they call us, we get on scene, we work with that patient, we've done some ultrasound on the way, they may have TXA going, they may be intubated, but we talk to the trauma surgeon, and some of our trauma patients that are really, really sick and have a positive ultrasound in the field and are hypotensive have not gotten pan scan, they've gone right to the operating room. So that's kind of how we've worked, and I'm sure with flight, you guys kind of have that same type of process worked out. Um, but in our small community, that, that's what we found to work. <clears throat> so how do we meet the mission? Training, station visits, ride-alongs, quality assurance, ED rotations. The quality assurance works much better if you know your providers. If you walk up to a paramedic and say, hey, that call last night, why didn't you get that intubation? What's wrong with you? Th that's a lot different than knowing the person having gone to their pancake breakfast the weekend before and walking up to them saying, hey, I know you want to do what's best for the patient, so let's talk about this call. And when you're the medical director, you need to make sure that you praise in public and punish in private. So keep that in mind. You never want to embarrass a paramedic. And paramedics and EMTs and firefighters, they're tough and burly types of people. They have some of the thinnest skin on earth around their ego. Okay? So if they come in, and whether you're an intern or a resident or a med tech, and you say, why'd you do that? They don't hear, why did you do that so I know how to take the next steps with the patient clinically? They hear, they challenged me. They don't think I did the right thing. They think I killed that patient. So you just have to be kid gloves a little bit. Maybe they're tougher in Madison. I don't know. But okay. So what would be nope. good language? What is safe language? I, you know, what, what I typically say to them is like, hey, I need to know what my next steps are, so can you guys just tell me what your thought process was and why we're down this path so we can move forward? Something like that. And, and I do tell them, like, if there's an interaction with the provider, and I know it's negative, and it happens, you know, even with me and my paramedics, I know them very well, but there's a negative interaction. You take care of the patient first. You don't talk in front of the patient. Because really, other than intubating someone or maybe decompressing their chest, is it an emergency to know why they didn't start an IV? Is it an emergency to know why they gave 150 of AMEO instead of 300? Most of the stuff doesn't matter for a few minutes. So then you do what you need to do, and then you go talk to the crew and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking with the patient, and, you know, Assuming they're still there, sometimes they're gone and you miss that opportunity. But I would never have a discussion in front of the patient unless it's immediately dangerous to the life and health of the patient for somebody about to put a chest tube on the wrong side or, or give a wrong dose of a drug. But you just have to, in medicine, you just have to really be kind to each other, I think. And that's a hard thing to do because everybody gets all jacked up on adrenaline. But when you sit back and realize it, it doesn't matter if my medics put an IV in a trauma patient because we're using permissive hypotension They've got the airway, they've splinted the long bone fracture, the patient's got pain meds intramuscular, 
we can put an IV in when they get here. You know, you, you, you got to understand their environment. Sometimes they have three minutes from somebody shot on the corner to get to you. Do you want them to sit on scene starting an IV and drawing blood? And so when you say these things, you know, some of my medics before we kind of pushed the envelope and, and told nurses, sometimes you're not going to have an IV when they come in, they would sit on scene with a stroke patient to get an IV because they knew they'd get yelled at if they didn't have an IV when they came in. So what's the goal with a stroke patient? Blood sugar CAT scan, right? That's all you need. So now with our stroke patients, they come in, they get a blood sugar, they go right to CAT scan, and if they need an IV, we get an IV when we get the IV. And I think a lot of the shift has been for our intubations is we'll intubate people with IM meds if we have to. Or you give them the ketamine, then you can get the IV when they're not fighting and flailing with you. So it all works, uh, but like doing an EM residency with no attending presence, something is missing in EMS if the medical director is not engaged and involved. You wouldn't, well, depending on what football team, and I'm not going to talk Bears or Packers, that gets me in trouble with the Wisconsin-Illinois thing now that I'm doing. Um, but if you had your paramedics and you trained them and you did QA and you did the sim with them and you never ran a call with them, that's kind of like having a football team, training them, putting them in the Super Bowl, and then not even being on the sideline for them. So you need to be their coach and you need to be their medical conscience. So we're not the only ones doing it. Here's vehicles from all over the country. So it's not just my crazy idea, it's everybody else's crazy idea too. So here's some data from the presentation we did. I know you guys are academic, you like studies. So thousand service medical director, and this is Dr. Brian Clemency, by the way, did this research. Thousand service medical directors surveyed. Uh, there is a small percentage that has a vehicle, there's 1% that wants a vehicle, and then the rest are all liars. <laughs> so this is Dr. Cohn, Dave Cohn, he's a, a premier researcher in EMS, I did my fellowship under him. Here's an accident, and um, this one was a near miss for me because it was an unconscious guy that I almost intubated, but then I checked his blood sugar and gave him an Ampa D50 and he woke up. So it would have been very embarrassing to show up at the hospital with an intubated hypoglycemic patient that had no injuries. Uh, here's a car that ran into a house. This guy was sleeping in his house. It was his birthday. He gets back from his birthday, finally lays down at 2 in the morning, and all of a sudden there's a loud explosion and he's pinned under a Volvo that was running from the police oh. through his house. He's on a mattress pinned under the vehicle. Now this is over a basement. So they had to shore up the basement, cut through a wall to get this guy out, and Dave was on scene with me on this one, and I was the fellow. So my job as a fellow was to take good pictures of the attending. So um, the other job that I had is after he did everything for the patient, I somehow ended up doing the transport and writing the report. So that's why Dave Cohn is smarter than me. Um, so we got the guy out and everything was fine, and his biggest injury was a, a burn on his uh, his his buttocks because he was face down prone out and the catalytic converter was sitting right on his bottom and we couldn't we couldn't do anything other than give him pain meds and wait to get the car off him so he had a basically a third degree burn so this is a lady they called out the the sharp team what do we call it? sharp team is what they call sponsor hospital physician program so she doesn't have two knees uh, the bones are facing ways that they shouldn't go and she was laying down on the ground and they couldn't control her pain so we showed up and we gave a dose of ketamine and then she was fine to move. And we, we reduced all the fractures and took her to the hospital. And that's where my love affair with ketamine started. <laughs> okay, these are two garbage workers. Their reflective anti-class three vests weren't reflective enough. Apparently some drunk hit them and put them through the windshield. Um, we know they're both alive because you wouldn't put a non rebreather on a dead person, and they both actually survived minus some legs. Uh, this is the first MD1 call, and I think we ran this with you guys. This was on um, Highway 14 in Evansville. It was in the winter, and there was a dead guy laying on top of a guy that was alive when we got there. We extricated him, and there were a couple other people. I think you guys flew one or two off this scene, and then we took another one. Um, I think all of them ended up RSI. but. It was funny because Dr. Barney was working. He's old, so I was worried about him hearing the pager. Um, so <laughs> pagers go off, and I call him. I'm like, Rick, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm sleeping. I said, did you hear the pager? He's like, yeah, I'm getting up. And uh, I was like, okay, this is our first call. So I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you live two minutes away. I said, you go to the bathroom, and I'll meet you in the truck, right? So we get in the truck. We show up together. We open the door. The medics are, are trying to get an IV. They're like, hey, we think this guy needs to be tubed. 
I'm like, fine, we'll, we'll help you with that. And uh, he looks at a young paramedic, smart ass, looks at you docs having a slumber party? Because we showed up together at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so this is a guy that was about 400 pounds. And I didn't really want to take any pictures of his face, but he was partially ejected. He was pinned between the A and the B post. His head was actually pinned between the, the B post and the ground. And his legs and everything were all pinned up in there. And he was, it took a while to get him out. Um, he ended up having like a broken wrist and some cracked ribs, but overall he did pretty well, other than the fact that it was his boss's brand new truck that he rolled. All right, canine care. So I'm not a veterinarian, but you're the doctor on scene because the fire departments put us on these Mabus boxes to run rehab and help the firefighters. They pull a dog out like 35 minutes into the fire and they bring the dog out and they're like, well, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know, give it oxygen. <laughs> so they give it oxygen. They're like, do you think the dog's okay? And I'm like, he's breathing. His eyes are open. So the owners came over and the dog recognized him. I said, well, it looks like his mental status is good. And they're like, you're good, doc. <laughs> so we gave the family the oxygen and the lady's pulling out and I see her with a cigarette. I'm like, don't like that. Why? You got oxygen. Just trust me on that one. Don't, don't like that. All right, this one, um, it was like minus 20. I mean, it was really, really cold on this one. Our IV fluids froze. There were two people in this car. It took about 30 minutes to get them out. We tried to push the ketamine through the IV because she actually had a broken tib fib and she was pinned under the dashboard and she was hurting pretty bad. Um, unable to push the ketamine because the IV had frozen. So we gave it IM instead and it worked just fine. All right, so Mike asked me to talk. I think these pictures are very valuable, I think. I can't wait until time when we in the ED get these pictures in real time, and um, hopefully our HIPAA and IT interfaces can work where that happens. But also, going back, I do think pan scanning is a problem, but it's also interesting because a lot of these patients um, that we kind of gasp a little bit about how, how traumatic the injury looks, also show up looking like a, exactly like those patients that just had a fender bender, right? Because by the time EMS does their things, they put them in a collar, they come in, and we make them naked, everyone looks the same mm -hmm. for the most part. Yep. And so it's really hard. So where did the trauma surgeon's paranoia come from is the concept that it could have been this or it could have been a fender bender mm -hmm. and we don't know. And that's where I think the um, overkill happens. I think once we can start matching up mechanism um, with patients, it'll be, it'll be a little bit more helpful because I think at the end of the day, they all look the same walking in which is why when they do roll in, we have to treat them the same to some extent because we don't have this perspective. Yep, otherwise you miss things. So there, that's certainly a valid point. This lady, I'm sure she had spleen and liver lacerations. When you look at that and you're gonna focus on the leg when she comes in, but you know, you certainly need to find out what's going on in the belly. So Mike asked me to talk about the, the legal parameters about this. Um, so DHS 110, at least in Wisconsin, says that the EMS medical director shall supervise all actions of the EMS system, basically. Here's the qualifications you should have. You have to be residency trained, at least in Wisconsin. Now, some states you can be a podiatrist or a, or a chiropractor and be the EMS medical director. It just depends on what state you go to. Some states, such as California, the EMS agencies, some of them don't even need a medical director. So they just do whatever they think is best. And this is the line here, ensures that all aspects of the emergency medical services are under medical supervision and direction at all times. That's why you need to have associate medical directors, you need to be available so when there's problems that occur, you can handle them in real time or as near real time as possible. All right, here's how medical directors are viewed. So the first <laughs> responder sees this as Superman, the EMT sees this as the devil, paramedic sees this as godlike, and uh, well, that's what, that's, I'm sorry, that's, See, I, I've been out of academics too long. I can't even read my picture chart here. All right, so first responder sees I just want to see if the system is Justin Bieber. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one right here. So the EMTs see the paramedics as that guy, the drunken college guy. Um, you know, the medical directors, we're, we see ourselves as Chuck Norris. So, <laughs> and it is kind of true, these perceptions that people have. Now, I don't see all my providers as fighting kids. Okay, 
but I do see them as people that need a lot of continual reminders of policies and, and protocols and those types of things. Yeah, I, I can email it to you if you want them to. Okay, so is that the medical director there? There is a certain amount of respect that you carry by being the medical director, but every negative interaction you have with a paramedic or an EMT or a provider or law enforcement or a 911 dispatcher diminishes that authority. So you catch more flies with honey. So how do we help? Uh, training and education, EMS advocacy, scope of practice, public support, protocol revisions. During the call, we have online medical control. Do you guys take the red phone calls or the medical direction calls here as residents? Not yet. Okay. So when I did my residency and fellowship, we were constantly pulled away from patient care to answer the phone. And when you're sewing someone or doing an LP or doing a procedure or you want to watch the, the ortho procedure, you're like, I really don't want to answer this squad call right now. The other thing is a lot of the locum doctors we had working in the area didn't know our protocol. So the paramedics would call, ask for an order for something, and they'd say, well, you shouldn't give that drug. That's ketamine. That's for horses. Or you know, follow your protocol. Well, I wouldn't be calling if I didn't have a question. So what we do is whoever's on call with the truck 24-7 carries the, we call it the PERV alert phone, because the paramedics call the vehicle the PERV the physician's emergency response vehicle. So the PERV alert phone rings, and I got a call at four o'clock this morning, and it was a life alert call, and the patient said she was fine and didn't want EMS. So the basic crew called me at three in the morning and said, Doc, they don't want us to respond. Is it okay if we cancel? She said she's just sleeping and bumped her button. I'm like, you know what? You guys go back to bed, and I'm gonna go back to bed. Uh, the other day, we got a call and the paramedics had a cardiac arrest on the interstate. They're working the patient. V-fib arrest, they shock her. Then she goes into a wide complex, AFib, RVR, VTAC. They can't really determine what it is. So they called and said, what's the dose of amio? I said, is she awake? They said, no. I said, so is she stable or unstable? He's like, okay, got it. We'll shock her. So sometimes they just need those gentle reminders. And, and with that call, the amount of time where they asked that question to the amount of time they were at the hospital was about three minutes. That's about the time it would have taken to even find someone to answer the phone in most emergency departments. So we've got a lot of time savings. And the, the phone calls are recorded. They go through the VOIP server and they get recorded. And then if they get into something, they may call us, hey, we're on scene with this 800-pound guy. He doesn't really want to go to the hospital. We think it might be cellulitis, but we can't tell if it's just red because he's normally red down there. Can you come look at it? Fine. After the call, uh, we QA, we answer questions, do CISD. You know, something that's important is you are captain of the ship. When you're the EMS medical director, you're the ED attending, it all comes to you. And at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. So when you show up on a scene and your provider's there and there's three dead kids there that are obviously dead, and they ask you, the doctor, to check and make sure everybody's dead so they know they did the right thing. That's a huge responsibility. And that right there is worth the $4,000 a month student loan payments I have right now. To know that people trust you that much and you're there providing that. Um, and I know you guys with MedFlake get the same response. People say, thank God you guys came here. We needed the help. You know, and that's huge. You just don't get that working in the ER sometimes. So that's why I love being in the field so much. To, uh, just to clarify, CISD is Critical Incident Stress Debrief. And it's something that it's getting better, but there's a, a culture in a lot of public service, law enforcement, fire, EMS, that they're too tough to need that. So I think in the last year, I have probably made arrangements for four or five critical incident stress debriefs, regardless of if anybody, anybody asked for them or not. And it's the same thing, being an advocate and looking out for their best interests, because it's you know, we, we take a lot of the stuff home with us as it is, and they don't even get to know the outcome half the time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks. I no, appreciate it. So some of the things we implemented, we put the Lucas out, uh, pushed the video intubation, changed the protocols for the RSI, uh, and actually they came from one of your medics, AJ Greeley. He, he came down, and we, we were doing the RSI training. He said, why can't we just use two of ketamine and two of sucks? And I said, you can't use two of sucks and choline, you'll kill people. And so I called Ron Walls, and um, he's like, no, you know, use two, and you can give it IM. I'm like, you can give it IM? So that was like, wow, I never learned that, you know? 
So we've put lots of people down with IM ketamine and IM sucks when we can't get an IV or they're, they're just difficult to access. Um, so we listen to our medics. I think AJ has stock in the ketamine company. I think he so might. He here. loves it. So at any rate, changing that protocol and making things simple and not doing math in the back of an ambulance, if you can do that for your providers, that's huge. You're doing weight-based charts or making it easy because I can tell you in the back of an ambulance, the weight is very hard to estimate when you're rolling down the road and trying to do math at three in the morning. It just bad outcomes happen when you have to think and do math in the back of the truck. On-call EMS physician, we already talked about that. Uh, Increased appreciation for EMS field activities. Well, now the nurses know why we don't want an IV on a stroke patient. Um, now the other doctors in the ER know why my paramedics don't do a 12 lead on a stroke patient because the goal is to get the CT scan. Nothing else matters until you get the CAT scan. So you're going to be waiting on the CAT scan read anyway at least 10 minutes, maybe less in Cleveland or Houston where they have mobile MR or mobile CT trucks. But the goal is to have an awareness of why EMS does what they do. And we've served as a model for other agencies uh, in other states. They've called to ask how we set it up and the legal parameters and all that type of stuff. It's legal and legit. It's an ALS intercept service registered with the State Office of EMS in Wisconsin and Illinois. Today we're going for our inspection in Illinois. They want to make sure we have oral airways and some BLS supplies on the truck and then we're going to be licensed. So uh, it's free. And that's kind of shocking to some people too. We don't charge for it because our hospital CEO sees this as a charity case and he sees this as something that builds the quality within the system. Uh, it's just like the helicopter, if our providers have a bad accident and they call us but they don't need us, then they can cancel us. And it supplements, it doesn't replace the local EMS system. There's just another tool in the toolbox for the incident commander. And it is highly integrated into the system. We're on the Mabus box cards, which is the mutual aid box alarm system. So if a fire department goes to a fire and they say, well, we've got one engine and one tender and an ambulance, we need more help. The dispatcher drops the tones and they send more help. Well, the more help, now what's been added is the physician component. So we'll go to a structure fire. Most doctors wouldn't think that they're going to get out of bed at 2.30 in the morning to go to a structure fire and take care of rehabbing firefighters. I think between Wistrom and I, we've had three or four crikes responding on the Mavis box because about the time we're showing up, they're pulling out fire victims. Um, and we don't crike people just because we can, but if you can't open their mouth and they're all burned up and you're going to work them because they've got a blip on the monitor, you need to get an airway. So we're activated through the dispatch centers and we're probably going to switch over to Rockcom because they used to have React, so they had a 24-7 dispatch center. Now React has gone community and their dispatch center is, is it Oklahoma? I don't even know for air methods, Omaha. Uh, but they still have the dispatch center and they dispatch some services, so they're going to GPS track us and all that kind of stuff. If we get a tactical call, a lot of times the cops just call us on our cell phones because they don't want a lot of people know what's going on. They say, hey, what are you doing tomorrow at 4.30 in the morning? We're doing a warrant. Be there. So what happens? Uh, pagers go off, phones go off, dogs barking, kids are screaming, daddy's leaving again, and then you go to the call. And we try and get out the door within one to two minutes. We have all the radio systems, VHF, UHF, 800, 700, Starcom, Wiscom, iFern, Mark, all of that stuff. Um, dispatch is notified of our response and we'll attempt to contact our providers on the, the channel. Uh, we value the patient updates and like we said, they can cancel. And if they give us information on the way, just like if our crews give you information on the way, it helps. You will not hear us talking on the radio if you're talking on the radio. So we respond on the Mark channel just like you guys do a lot of times. If the helicopter's inbound, we don't talk on the radio. The incident commander knows we're coming. They might not know when we're going to get there. We might not have any patient information, but we try and maintain that sterile cockpit. We're smart enough to not talk when they're trying to land a helicopter. And if my guys aren't, then you tell me about it, and then I'll slap their little pinky finger with a wet noodle or something. All right, so we don't transport. If we do anything outside the scope of the providers, we transport with them. Um, we prefer to have one of them drive the MD-1 to the hospital non-emergently and then we can get back in service faster. We've left it on scenes at times and so far we haven't lost a truck yet. There's been some questionable neighborhoods where the police have actually driven our truck to the hospital and said, hey doc, can you give me a ride back to get my cruiser? I'm like, you drove my truck here? He's like, they're not going to steal my cruiser, but they know the good stuff is in your truck. All right. I'm being recorded, so it's helping me with my curse count. I'm trying not to curse because I got small kids, and they don't—they don't, they don't want to talk like us. 
All right. So MD1 will work in conjunction with HEMS, and I think this is important. Multiple patients, you know, we might take care of some patients, you guys take care of other patients. Time-sensitive condition, transport by air versus ground. Unstable uh, airways, best interest of the patient, keeping resources available. So there's been times where you guys have been called and then you've been canceled because we're on scene. At least that's the perception. Well, they may have called for you, we got on scene, and we found that there weren't four victims, there were only two, and they were minor. So we're not going to keep you inbound for something that doesn't need it. Now, there's been other calls where we've been on scene, and there's certain things we can handle, certain things we can't. Um, perfect example is a pediatric head bleed. The girl fell off her skateboard or her scooter or something. Dr. Wistrom responded, and it was um, in one of our areas. And we very consciously made the decision we're not going to any of the local hospitals, Mercy included, because we don't have a pediatric ICU or a pediatric neurosurgeon. So we're just going to get the airway, and we're going to wait here and send it to UW. Of course, now that we merged with Mercy Rockford, you know how the ACO model works, so the patient will probably go to Mercy Rockford now. That's just the way it works now. It's not that we don't love you guys, it's just that's the ACO model and everybody wants to try and keep it in-house when they can. So who are the docs? Uh, no suits and ties. We wear them if we have to. Um, paramedics or EMTs, we work the ER. Some of us are fellowship trained, some of us aren't. And there's some of the, the docs that we've got on our team now. A lot of the equipment we already talked about, so I'll kind of blow through this quick. Uh, we do carry central lines and chest tubes, and this is uh, something that we rarely use. If we put a central line in someone in the field or a chest tube in the field, they're having a really, really bad day. Um, that is the person that has a bilateral pneumothorax that's not being relieved with needles or the guy with a blood pressure of unperceivable. Um, that we've got an IO in and he's a post-cardiac arrest and my IO is just dribbling the dopamine in. So we know that the stuff we do in the field is not necessarily the most cleanest, but I think I'm going to get a bumper sticker for the truck that says you have to be alive to get an infection. <laughs> we will suture people and uh, do hemorrhage control devices. We actually carry the, um, the junctional tourniquet, which most agencies don't carry because it's expensive. We carry a cyanide kit on each truck and we have uh, a couple that are stocked in the ER so if there's a major fire we can get that out to them. Uh, we do ultrasound in the field. I've used ultrasound to place IVs on patients that uh, you know needed IV access. We've used it for the eFast and all that type of stuff. Um, somebody wants to get super creative here because one of the other docs put this slide together. Confirmation of tube placement. You know. After you do the end title and look again and make sure it's there, if you want to do your ultrasound, if that makes you feel better, then you go right for it. But the studies that I've read on that are not very optimistic. Um, so how do we drive down most appropriate destination and transport decision? Who knows what hospitals in a region have capabilities better than the doctors? Okay, the paramedics don't know that you guys have a neuropediatric ICU and pediatric otolaryngology and and, and Meritor doesn't, and the other one does. So it's all about resources, getting people to the right place. At least me personally, I hate pit stopping patients. Like, if they're not destined for a community hospital as their terminal destination, then they shouldn't go there in the first place. If it's a STEMI patient, they should go where there's a cath lab. If they're a trauma patient, they should go to a level one or a level two if that's what they need. <laughs> if it's a level three trauma, then, then that's fine too, but to have these these high-risk patients going to community ERs and then sitting there and you guys have all flown in on them just like we've I did during residency and they're sitting in these community ERs for 30 40 minutes and nothing's been done for them and you just smile and wave and take them out in the truck or the helicopter and do what you need to do and then you take them somewhere else so we reduce the time so if somebody's intubated when they come in it's faster to CAT scan um, if we already know there's blood in the belly and they're hypotensive we know they go to the OR and then the trauma surgeons do get to see the pictures from our scenes. They do get to talk to us directly. So that is one thing. And as far as the pictures, what's interesting is back in 1994 when I was a paramedic and we had Polaroids, we sent every picture with the helicopter. We'd take a Polaroid and send it. But now with digital cameras, it's, you know, until you can print the images and just hand them off, it, now it gets complicated because you get IT people involved. So difficult airway burns, obese patients, cardiac arrest. We don't get called on cardiac arrest as much as we used to because now all of our providers have the uh, Lucas and the video intubation. 
and we've done a ton of sim on cardiac arrest. Our providers do probably two to three sims a year each on cardiac arrest and RSI and medical stuff. Severe multi-system trauma, gunshot wound, we've told them if they're shot between the diaphragm and the neck, you should call for the physician to come to the scene because they could need a chest tube. If they're shot in the belly or anywhere else, if you can control the bleeding with a tourniquet or TXA or pack it with combat gauze, you don't need me, you need the trauma surgeon. Mavis boxes, we talked about that. Um, so we get called for pretty much everything they think they need a doctor for now. Um, Dr. Wistrom responded to a little girl, she was MRDD, she had stepped on a step and the step broke, her foot went through and she was pinned on a nail that was underneath and it kind of, you know, like a boa's tooth, it was, it was recurved, so it was, it was hooked in her leg and they couldn't get her out. So they were going to cut a hole in the wall and then remove the entire staircase and transport the staircase to the ER. So somebody said, well, maybe the doctor can do something, or at least make her comfortable. So they called us the scene. Wistrom did a little injection. He reached in, injected, took a scalpel, made an incision. The nail popped out, and she was freed, and the family staircase was kept intact. So the little stuff like that goes a long way in the community. And that's obviously something, if they would have called a helicopter out for that, somebody would have said, what is wrong with you people? So I, I think there's a role for both things in the system. It's just how you use them and how they work together. All right, this gentleman was somebody that went into a, a grain or a corn silo, and what happens is that they get little pockets in it, and the, the corn actually gets mold on it, and it forms a layer. So it looks like it's a floor, basically. And you step on it, it collapses, and all that weight comes down around you. So what we did there is we took care of... Is that you guys? Okay. Thank you. Be safe, thanks. <laughs> He's probably going to Janesville because I'm not there. I've got the truck here. Um, and, and that's another thing. When we're not there, we tell our dispatchers. We don't play the shell game. We'll call Rock County Dispatch or Walworth Dispatch and say, I'm going to be in Madison for two hours. So if they call for us, the Walworth truck would be what you have available. So just figure that out. And um, we try and be upfront with people of what we can and can't handle at Mercy. That, that's one of the key things that we have never told a provider we can handle something that we can't to try and get the patient. You do that, it's unethical and it's just wrong and we're not going to do that. So uh, this guy got trapped in there. We did a lot of eye irrigation. We did a lot of CISD on scene because they would get up to the guy and touch his hand and then he would disappear again for a couple hours. It was a very frustrating extrication. And they all knew the guy was dead, but when the guy's wife and family is there crying to get him out, it just it was very emotional. So we did a lot of eye care. We did a lot of breathing treatment because the corn has a lot of mold in it. And these guys are wheezing and hacking and we have limited technical resources there, technical rescue people, so if I pull one of them out, it slows the operation down another couple hours. Whereas if I pull them out, give them a couple breathing treatments, give them some oxygen for a while, maybe some IV fluids or even some mag, and he's not wheezing and he's ready to go back in, I kind of did an observation stay in the back of the truck for an hour, and then he was able to go back. Country Thunder, anybody ever been there? Okay, and you remember it, that's impressive. So Country Thunder is outdoor music festival. I think last year there were over 60,000 people there. So in previous years, the ERs in that area were totally congested and they actually went on diversion. So what we started doing three years ago is we put doctors out there. One doctor works a 12 hour shift during the peak of it. We do wound care, we do sutures, we call in people's inhalers prescriptions that they forgot. We've dosed people with steroids, we've dosed antibiotics for a guy that had a knee laceration all the way down to the bone. He wasn't drunk, he, he had mental capacity, and he said, I'm not going to the hospital, I don't need to. I packed it with mud because my friend said that prevents infection. So Wistrom calls me, he said, what do I do with this guy ethically? And I said, well, he needs to go to a hospital. He said, he is adamantly not going. And he said, well, I don't know what, to, he said, it's pouring blood out of this thing. He said, should I close it? And we're kind of having this discussion. And we, we do that sometimes to bounce it off of each other. And he said, I wouldn't close it. So he put some loose sutures in it. Um, so it would pus out, but it wouldn't keep bleeding and ruin the concert. You don't want to do that. And then they gave the guy antibiotics until he went home two days later and told him, you need to see an orthopedic surgeon. You, you might already lose that leg. But he was absolutely refusing to leave because he paid $100 for his tickets. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> And we, we do intubate a lot of people at Country Thunder. Intubate? Uh, intubate. So the first day that Dr. Wistrom went there, it's within our region, and he calls me. He's like, I like country music. Can I go to this event? 
because we didn't know what it was like. Wistrom and I were new medical directors. The previous docs had never gone out here. So he called me at like literally 2 in the morning and he said, hey, um, do we have extra succinylcholine on the truck? I'm like, well, there's two vials in the RSI kit. There's another two in the back of the safe. He's like, yeah, I already used all those. Like, like, what are you doing out there? He said, he's like, you would not believe it. He said, people are coming in. They're unresponsive. There's drugs. Everybody's aspirating. He said, it's a disaster. I've already intubated five people out here. And I'm like, good God. So then... You know, and, and sometimes it goes back to what you don't, you don't know what you don't know. And the previous medical director said, oh, it's just a small music festival out there, and we don't even go out there. I just go out to look at the girls, quote, unquote, okay? And this thing turns into this debacle that I'm signing off on the operational plan because I didn't go out there the first year. So you need to know what's going on in your system. So once I took over as medical director, we got out there and we kind of got a handle around it and we said you need to add more gators, you need to add more ambulances, and you probably need to have a physician there. And I think there's a guideline that anything over 20,000, you should probably have a physician on site that's in our mass casualty research. It'll be on, that we need to, it'll be on our board, yeah, so we got to learn that one. So we did a lot of good stuff out there. Now, these gators, the other thing we changed, they were sending these out with firefighters on them. And not that firefighters are bad. But they came back with a drunk. So Wistrom walks up to the guy you know, on the back of the gator, and he's like, he's not breathing. Hey, guys, he doesn't have a pulse. It was a guy that was walking. He passed out in a group of people. They went out and retrieved him, and, and thank God things lined up. They got him back probably in about five minutes. So he's probably only down five minutes, but he was a V-fib arrest, a 19-year-old kid with a congenital heart that was enjoying the event, um, and he, he was okay. But he took prolonged CPR, he took um, lots of push-dose pressors that the paramedics probably wouldn't have known how to do, and he was, he was very uh, tentative if he was going to survive for a while, but he had a pretty full recovery. We try and educate all the kids, but they all want to be firefighters in the end, we know it. They just fake it for us for a while, but they want to be firefighters. <laughs> And, you know, here's something that's important. So if you go into a system and you're the EMS medical director, if somebody calls you to do a news article or to do a, an interview or to have a reporter do a ride along with you, do it. Because three years ago, I would not have talked to the media. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's not my gig. I'm not the public information officer. Well, part of the reason why we've enjoyed such success and our hospital administration supports us is because we have such good community relations. And part of getting good community relations is talking to the media. You know, we built our tactical training center. We had the media there. They were all over that thing. And now, going from a, you know, one county tactical training center, the thing's gone national. We've got people from South Carolina, Iowa, Kentucky, and all these places calling, when can we come and take the classes there? So don't discount the effect the media can have on you. So tactical EMS, if you build it, they will come. So two of our paramedic instructors came to me and a police officer from the community. He said, hey, Doc, we need to build a tactical training center. I'm like, I'm tapped out. They built a $1.2 million training center with new sim labs. They're not going to spend any money on this. He said, no, we really need this. And he gave me all the reasons. I'm like, okay, we'll try. And uh, we happened to have some old OR space in the Mercy Care building. And lo and behold, admin supported us using that space. And we bought the mannequin and we hired a couple tactical instructors. And it's been going well ever since then. This is Caesar. He squirts blood. Uh, if you don't put the tourniquet on right, he will continue to bleed and die. Um, he actually looks at you and looks to the side you're putting the tourniquet on. He talks. Um, he whines. He bleeds out of everywhere. He can bleed out of his belly. He can bleed everywhere. I haven't simulated GI bleed yet, but we could probably do that. Um, we got lots of cow manure in Rock County, so we can mix it up with some dead pig blood and get the smell. So, it's one of the things we're doing. And then I have no idea what's next. I have no idea. Um, you, you know, what's important is, although I'm not academic, I was trained in a very academic center and that kind of stays with me. And even though we're not necessarily doing research, we still keep up on the research and try and project the trajectory of where EMS is gonna go. And I think that the community paramedic and ACOs and pre-hospital care, it's all gonna continue to, to just get bigger. Now, one other thing I'm gonna tell you. And this is not an easy job. What we are doing with the Physician Response Program, and Mike can tell you the, the rumors about me in the state. I think I have a target painted on my back right now. Um, 
somebody went to the State Trauma Advisory Committee last week, and it's a public meeting, so I can share my dirty laundry, and said that um, the MD1 transported a critical burn patient to one of the local hospitals, didn't wait for an ambulance. Um, we also accused of putting central lines in people and then sending them in a helicopter and giving them a massive pneumothorax, which we've never done a subclavian, and we don't carry three-foot needles, so I don't know how it could be true. Um, and all these things are just rumors that come out because people hear things from someone who heard one thing. Um, the rumor is that we've amputated a ton of limbs. Well, I don't have a bunch of dead arms and legs in the truck. We haven't done any amputations. We've got equipment to do it. So you just have to be very careful, and when these rumors come up, the best thing to do is just meet them head on and not hide from it. So I went and presented at the Illinois State Fire Chiefs Mavis conference last night. I went to um, the SIRTAC and tried to, to, to squash some of these rumors. But you know the fact is we're all residency trained doctors, and we're not doing anything different in the field than we would do in the emergency department. You know, if I'm not going to put a chest tube in someone in the ER, I'm not going to do it in the field. It wouldn't make sense. And I have a pretty high threshold to do that in the field. You know, a trauma arrest that's shot in the chest, well, what's a worse uh, risk than being dead? So if they're already dead, what, you know, you have to do risk benefit on all this stuff. And, and the fact that people question my risk benefit and my ethics in the public, it's a bit annoying to me. But I understand people talk and that's just how it goes. So. You have to have thick skin, and Mike talked about my four kids, so when I go home, I hug my kids at night, I talk to my wife, go to church, do all that stuff, pretty much so I don't get so mad that I blow up in public. And, and you as physicians, you have to understand that you are a leader, and when you walk through the ER or you walk through a fire station, people know you're a doctor, and that carries a, a, a very specific amount of respect to it. You're very highly perceived in the community. People know who you are, especially in a small community. So when I go to Walmart or Target or wherever I go, people know who I am. So you have to treat people well. Even if you don't write them the Percocet, you leave on good terms. You try to. Now some people, we still drag them out with the cops. I get that. But all in all, you try and maintain a good relationship. There's one other thing I want to talk to you about, and this is important. And I think Dr. Barney would want me to talk about this. So Dr. Barney worked with you guys here. He worked with me for several years. He had a back injury back in the 90s, and he got hooked on narcotics. He came off the narcotics, he went through rehab, but because of his actions, he got a felony charge. He was off, uh, he's in the physician monitoring program, peeing in a cup every few days, everything was fine. He was off, he was about to get off probation, and he got put on the OIG exclusion list a year and a half after his conviction. So now he can't work anywhere that receives federal funding. So Dr. Barney can't work with me. He can't teach. He can't help me develop a PowerPoint. He can't prepare any surgical trays for the hospital. He can't even volunteer at a hospital. So those of you that are here, if you ever in your career have an issue with a drug or any other legal issue, you need to nip it in the butt on the front end because if you get put on that list, your career is probably effectively over. Now fortunately for Rick, he was towards the tail end of his career. Now the only thing he might be able to get is if you can show there's a, a, a need in the community, you can sometimes get a waiver. But there's 40,000 people on this exclusion list. There's only been 18 waivers granted. So if you get put on that exclusion list, you have to know for five years you are basically unemployable by any healthcare agency. And it's very difficult to open your own shop in town and hang a shingle and say, well, I'm an ER doctor, I'm just going to do primary care on my own and take only cash. Who's going to come see that doctor? So. It's very uh, important that you, you keep your nose clean and you, if you have an issue, you address it through your state's physician program. Um, now, the reason Rick had problems because it became a federal case because somebody reported to the DEA and, and if you ever have questions about addiction, Rick is more than happy to talk to people. He's been a tremendous resource in our community. I just know that some of the rumors out there already in the state are, well, he, he relapsed and he's using again. It's absolutely not true. So I just wanted to say that. If there's any questions or any rumors, you guys can always ask me. As you can tell, I really don't have anything to hide. So question, yes, sir. Um, so we, there have been a couple comments um, about uh, how it would be nice if we could photograph scenes, send them to the ED to say this is the extent of the damage that we're seeing, uh, just to give you an idea of what to expect. Um, but that obviously that um, has HIPAA issues. 
Um, but my understanding of, of HIPAA, in order to be HIPAA compliant, all you need is a institution approved device that is meets certain encryption standards, which is not difficult to obtain. I mean, it would be as simple, Dr. Wilmer, I think, is providing all the local crews with, a, with an iPhone that has been encrypted and have another one here that can only send to each other. So there's, I think there's actually two issues there. Anything that's in the public eye technically wouldn't be covered by HIPAA, so an accident on the side of the highway, anybody can take a picture of it driving by. So I, I think that that portion is not a part of the issue. The cell phone or the device is something that we've gone round and round with, um, and mass suppliers are trying to figure out right now how they can do it more effectively because there's a ton of times where a radio report, because anybody can eavesdrop in on that one, they have to be very guarded. A direct conversation would be better, um, but they also have to have the safeguards to keep people from misusing those, uh, which unfortunately does happen from time to time. So I, I agree with you. I think that there's nothing more helpful, and they pull me aside all the time, like, hey, look at this car that crashed into the back of the semi, and it's usually helpful for the direction we go with the mechanism and the workup. Um, I just don't know how to get it out effectively to everybody so that they can start using it. One thing that, I mean, this is a little <coughs> bit off topic, and I don't want to um, lose the momentum that Jay just finished, but there is um, an ingrown product called WixMD, which actually um, Jim's an investor in, and they've already sold the product to Kaiser and some other areas. UW itself has had a hard time rolling it out, but we're on the cusp of rolling out this product, which basically means anyone can use their phone um, all you have to do is have a barcode associated, and there's ways to get barcodes out. You take a picture of the barcode, you take a picture, and then when he come, once he comes back, it can link up directly to Healthly. Because as you know, all the ortho residents, everyone's doing this anyways on their phones, right? So they realize you have to be able to make it something that is as easy as everyone's cell phone can be used. Because um, even the uh, ordained uh, camera, Germ has complained, no one spends the time to get it, retrieve it, keep it compliant, all that stuff. So I think we're just on the cusp, a couple of years, from where um, that technology will be widely spread in, in the hospital, and then I think then the natural extension will be how to make it easier to not just get the picture, but actually incorporate into the patient's medical record. Um, so we're on the and that's Burby's? He's, he's, he's the an best investor in it, he didn't create it. When, when's the idea? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> going back to what Jay said about um, Rick, I do think from everything I've heard, obviously I interacted with Rick a little bit, but um, from everything I've heard, he's an amazing person, um, had contributed a lot to our specialty and, and uh, both locally and internationally. And it sounds like he's comfortable with the information you're sharing, otherwise I'm sure you wouldn't have shared it. Um, but, but what Jay has provided is absolutely true in terms of, um, it's one of those things where um, a, a even one strike can have disastrous ramifications. So, um, and I, I think s substance abuse, then you can also have some other mental health issues that kind of fall into that. And I think we are in a hard situation because where do you go for help um, if you do have a problem? But I think that's where it's always best to talk to supervisors and find things outside the health system that can make sure you get what you, I guess the bottom line is don't try to manage it on your own because these things can sometimes quickly escalate beyond what you can manage. And to add to the scary concept of not being um, um, employable, um, recently there's a case of someone who, pretty prominent, who um, for a variety of reasons had ended up with three different lawsuits against them. And when they came to change, and probably they're all legit, um, I think legit in terms of maybe there was no harm. Uh, actually, all three of them were still pending. So they hadn't even been deliberated yet. And so you don't really know where it's going to fall. Um, but when they came to get credentialing at a new hospital, they were declined. Um, and, uh, and I also don't know that they'll be able to get a, a license in a new state. So to actually be able to work as a physician, you first need to get a state license. And state licenses um, are getting harder and harder if there are some misconduct. And then you have to get hospital credentialing. And hospital credentialing is another one of those steps. So I think. Um, I think these are the kinds of things where it's always, um, when you said you you drop your guard, uh, the day you decide not everyone's about to die and you, you drop your guard, that's when the three lawsuits come, and those can also have significant ramifications. 
not to not to take it in a 180 okay. degree different direction, but we're going to go 180 degrees. Um, Dr. McNeil did share with me earlier today that his group, in addition to covering three counties and two states, they're looking to add some more people to the team. So it's actually, in, in Illinois, we actually have 11 counties. So uh, we have 13 counties so now. They're, to they're not terribly busy. <laughs> you guys are interested. I, I would direct you to talk to Dr. McNeil afterwards uh, for maybe some opportunities for you in the future, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Politically, how are you handling it, like in Winnebago County, where you have sort of competing systems mm -hmm. in the same geographical area? Like OSF has a level one trauma center, yep. and they will accuse you of you're taking our patients. You're how, how do you plan to handle? Because before that, you know, they sort of had their fiefdom sort of divvied up. Right. So right. How, how do you plan yeah, and what we what we do, and a lot of times we get in the back of the truck, and and as much as we get accused of patient steering, which we get accused of because all the hospitals want their patients um, there's times I don't even know what hospital we're going to until we start calling and, and we're halfway there and said where are we going because typically what we do is we tell the driver we need the nearest level one or level two trauma center so there's sometimes in Edgerton that it's closer to drive here or Evansville for way out on highway 14 with Brooklyn or Albany um, or it's patient request I and mean, if the patient's awake and talking to me and I go on a chest pain call in Evansville because Evansville doesn't have any people and Janesville's other ambulances are all tied up. If I show up um, because the patient has chest pain and they passed out, I might end up at UW with the patient because it's patient preference. I'm not gonna tell the patient, hey, I only take people to Mercy. So our CEO knows that we transport other places and, and he's given his carte blanche. He said, you know what, your job is to go run the pre-hospital system and take care of people. So down there, what, I met with their medical directors, I met with uh, Pearson and I met with Underwood and basically what we said when we have a meeting with them and the state is we're going to follow the destination <coughs> protocol. You know, it's patient preference and nearest available center. And now how are they going to treat us when we get in there? I, I don't know. Um, we're going to get UW jumpsuits so they'll be nicer yeah. to us. But <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting again now the whole Winnebago thing. I mean, you know, because they have three large hospitals. Mm -hmm. In fact, Swedes probably gets just as much level one trauma as yeah. the other two. Because they're west, yeah. Well, and then it's because of location. Plus, with their EMS plan, um, they don't necessarily always take them to level ones. But, right. Um, there's, there's a lot of nearest hospital in Illinois yeah. still, and that's something that we're looking to change, not because um, because of the, the money or anything, but because it's the right thing to do to not pit stop people. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting in Illinois. Um, we did meet with IDPH. We met with the medical directors, and there were some issues because initially we had done some tactical stuff, and we were accused in the media of jumping calls on Rockford Fire. Well, I'm with a cop, and we hear gunshots, and 30 seconds later, the cop's right there, and the, she's laying slumped over on the porch. I'm not going to stand there and say, well, I need to wait for the paramedics to show up. I'm going to do my doctor stuff. And, and that's where some of it came up, and I talked to the chiefs last night, and I said, MD-1 isn't even in operation in Illinois yet, so we're not jumping any calls. If you are our agency under Mercy Medical Direction, we will routinely go on calls with you. Um, if you're not our medical direction, we're not going on a call unless you formally request us to go. So our guys have calls, and if I'm driving by and they have a call for a nosebleed, literally, we've stopped by and put rhino rockets in people in the field. You know, So that's the kind of stuff we do. We just try and be doctors wherever we are. And your state medical license does in, at least in Wisconsin and Illinois, it does say at the scene of an emergency. So there is an implied, your medical license, which is one of the most powerful documents in the world, by the way, which is why you don't want to do things to, to lose it, um, it gives you the right to take care of patients wherever you find them. Thank you. I think that's a great question. Sure.